the agencies are throwing their statutory obligations out the window and taking incredible risks and they are on very thin ice. And one of the things that, that I've heard coming out of Washington is that's all deliberate, that these agencies know that they're overstepping their jurisdiction, that they're doing things for which they don't have statutory authority. But in the political decision that has been made between the Fed and the White House, they want to kill crypto and therefore they are taking, throwing caution to the wind is the way one, put, one, one insider put it. Hey, good people in crypto land. I'm Matt Lysing, and this is my podcast, Decent People. Welcome to the conversation. On today's show, I've got a special guest. We're talking about some newsy stuff that's just happening, a little bit different. I'm joined by Caitlin Long, who is the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank, which is a bank headquartered in Wyoming that is trying to be set up to cater to businesses that want to bridge the gap between crypto and the traditional financial world with US dollars. It's been a sore point in crypto for a very long time. Lots of banks for years were reluctant or refused to give banking services to any businesses that were dealing in cryptocurrencies in any fashion. And so what Caitlin is doing with Custodia is she is trying to play by the rules and is trying to get the right charters and all of the other important things you need for a bank. And one of these is getting access to the Federal Reserve so that you can borrow at the Federal Reserve, you can hold your money there. That's it, it just, it's very key to any banking operation that you have access to the Fed. So after two and a half years or so, Custodia's applications to the Fed have been denied and Custodia turned around and sued them. And the lawsuit makes for some very interesting reading. We get into that today. And we also talk about just the background of how regulation and maybe overstep by some regulatory bodies has led us to this point where it's still very hard to get banking if you're in cryptocurrencies and how that maybe has spawned some other alternatives like Tether and other things that are in the shadows rather than out in the broad daylight of the way that the traditional financial world usually works. So Caitlin and I get all into that and we talk about how it just doesn't seem the U.S. right at the moment is really in love with crypto and that there might be a faction in the government that wants to stamp it out, but there's also another faction that's also that is pro-crypto and how the pendulum might be swinging in Washington, D.C. at this moment. As always, if you can, leave us a review and give us those five stars so that more people can get exposed to our podcast here at Decentral Media. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the show, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, Caitlin, how you doing? Hey, Matt, good to see you. Doing yeah. great, thanks. Yeah, it's been how a little while. Nice to connect been. again. Yeah. I love your Wyoming horses in the background you've got there. Uh, yeah, for, riding for, for the listeners. ranch. <laughs> yeah, she's got some Mustangs, it looks like, on the wall. You bet. And yeah, so you, we are talking, and you are in Wyoming right now? Yep. You and I both moved back home after we yeah. did a lot of work together six or seven years back when we were both in New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm back in Los Angeles. Awesome. Great. So let's, uh, let's jump into it. You co founded and are the CEO of Custodia Bank, which yeah. is based in Wyoming. Wyoming has been on the forefront of a lot of Web3 and crypto-friendly regulation, the special purpose depository institution sort of legislation that went through a couple of years ago. Yep. But you've run into some problems with getting access to the Federal Reserve System, and you guys at Custodia ended up suing the Fed over this. I've seen the complaint, and I wondered if you could just jump in there and tell listeners what's going on and what the issues are here. I'll stay away from the lawsuit itself and just talk about the facts. If we go back in time to 2019, this time four years ago, the Wyoming legislature enacted the Special Purpose Depository Institution Charter. At that point, there it was one of the 13 different laws that the state of Wyoming had enacted, five in 2018, then another eight in 2019, and we're past 30 at this point, given that the legislative session is in session now in the sixth year mm -hmm. of enacting laws to provide really a legal clarity. It's it, That's what most of the Wyoming blockchain laws have done is provide legal clarity. We've definitely led the nation, had a very dedicated bipartisan group of legislators and just folks from the community who show up 
and help educate and help to define what we need. And the special purpose depository legislation was designed to solve a very specific problem, which is the debanking of this industry that happens in every Bitcoin bear market wave. And of course, the broader crypto industry tends to follow Bitcoin. And if you go back two bear markets ago, the reason why Coinbase emerged as the big 10 ton gorilla in our industry is because they were able to keep durable banking relationships. Back then, they were a fledgling company. I remember when I first started looking into it in 2013, they weren't that big compared to the rest of the industry. How did they become so big? Because they were able, when they lost their bank relationships in that 2014 bear market, they were able to quickly replace them and others were not. And the same thing happened in the 2018 bear market. That's where the Wyoming legislature heard a lot of testimony from legit entrepreneurs who lost their businesses because they lost their bank accounts. And in the United States, if you don't have a bank account, you are not a legitimate business because the IRS requires you to remit your withholding taxes through your bank. And yeah. it's tough. It's a tough problem. It's another reason I think why Tether became so important to the ecosystem because it served as a kind of de facto dollar in the market, in the global market, right. basically. See, yeah. and you were working in and around this sector back then. A lot of folks who came to it more recently don't understand that, the context. It's one of these things where regulators making decisions out of fear tend to get the very thing they feared. Tether was created in many ways out of necessity because Bitfinex, the affiliate company, got debanked. They were working with an offshore bank. They were offshore, have always been offshore, and so they say, and they were working with a non-domestic U.S. dollar bank, and then Wells Fargo debanked that correspondent bank, and they lost U.S. dollar banking services. And it, it, from what I understand, I've never met the Tether guys, but that, with, it, it, with, <laughs> yeah, good, good question. But a couple of the original founders that are no longer associated with them, yeah. I, I know, but, but the current folks I've never met. And they have, a, from what I understand, a concerted philosophy of stay away from the United States. Yeah. And given the regulatory actions in the last few weeks, Maybe that was right, but it does illustrate the whole question of the offshore U.S. dollar markets, right? So Tether clearly says they're operating entirely offshore and they they get their U.S. dollar clearing services from someone. Candidly, I've never been able to figure out who, but and a lot of people haven't as well. I ask around and people just don't know where are they getting their U.S. dollar clearing services. It's one of the yeah. industry's well-kept secrets. They were in Puerto Rico for a while. They were, right? They had Noble Bank. They've had to hopscotch and do all sorts of things over the years. Yeah. I, one of the things that I thought, because FTX was so connected to Tether, I thought that when FTX took that position in Moonstone, that was their way to try to get access to U.S. dollar correspondence services for Dell Tech, which was also banking Tether. But who knows? I don't know. It's never come out. That's one of the one of the open questions. What was FTX really trying to do when it took that big stake in this teeny tiny bank moonstone that had two employees uh, and suddenly got into the crypto business? Yeah. It, just lastly on Tether, it's amazing to me that it's still standing after we've seen all of these centralized institutions just absolutely collapse and there's so little known about Tether, but hey, it seems like they're doing something right. But to your main point, it's very difficult for crypto businesses to get that connection to fiat money, to US dollars, to euros, to yen. And that's, right. that's where Custodia came in. Is that, am I correct in that? Yes, that's correct. And again, I don't know. I don't, I'm not endorsing Tether. I've been I've actually been very critical of Tether for not disclosing where yeah. those assets are. Oh, yeah. And, I have two. Yeah. I have two. But yeah. it's amazing to me that they're still chugging along. They have, That's it's all I it's to fascinating. Say. It, exactly. It's, but it, it, and the broader point is regulators basically created Tether inadvertently by doing what they're doing now, which is cracking down on the industry. So yeah. what is going to be the next version of Tether? Look at what's going on with Lightning Network, Matt. It, it is fascinating. You can move any fiat currency anywhere in the world using Lightning as an intermediary currency. So you could do US dollar to US dollar, you could do US dollar to yen, et cetera. And nothing to ever touches a bank. And now Have you the Ripple have the guys seen this? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Right? XRP Good question. was supposed to do that exact same thing, but nobody wanted to touch it. But what's fascinating is that XRP is not decentralized, whereas yeah. Lightning Network is. there. It, it, and this is why this Noster 
phenomenon, which is quite a phenomenon. Nostra grew 5X just in the last month alone. Yeah. And it's, I think the numbers were 108,000 users a month ago to 625,000 now. And I just keep seeing it proliferating everywhere. And Lightning is essentially native to the Nostra protocol. It's a Bitcoin native or Bitcoin adjacent social media network that is entirely decentralized. So that's the difference is that it, if this really does take off, granted it's early stages, but of course, that was that's what makes it interesting to see it take off like it is. And if it just if it continues to propagate in its network effects, here's the punchline. Eight billion people in the world are going to be able to create U.S. dollars and use them using their phone and not touching the U.S. banking system. Yeah. This is a problem for the U.S. banking system. And by shoving everybody out, including the high integrity players like us, who were actually trying to, to figure out how to bridge these two systems in a safe and sound way and have it not end up causing problems on either end. That's the most important thing. Maybe we can come back and talk about that in a minute because it, if the regulators try to shove it out into the shadows, the tethers of the world are going to be the solutions. The engineers are going to find ways around all this. And I'm sure I know that the bank regulators view Tether as a problem. What they probably don't have the introspection to, to do is to recognize that their own regulatory de decisions were what created Tether in the first place. Yeah. And are they thinking about the implications of the regulatory decisions they've made in the last three weeks? And will they accept responsibility when they look back in a few years and see what the world, what the engineers did to get around them. Because thankfully we have the internet and anyone who can run code can get around the regulations. Yeah. It just is. Yeah. I always thought that the regulators would understand that creating the regulated versions of these centralized entities serving the industry would be the right approach because it would essentially create an incentive for people to stay in the lit markets. It's like ISPs versus Tor, right? Most of us use an ISP. Most of us use browsers, right? We're not browsing the internet on Tor. Same thing with making phone calls. We're using Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile in the US. We're not making a phone call using the command line interface. Okay, but we could use Tor instead of a browser. We could use a command line interface to make a, a phone call. Why is it that most people don't? It's the user experience and it's the trust because you're dealing with reputable entities and you're not in the wild west having to fend for your own security like you are in the dark markets, okay? So what the bank regulators have just done, especially the bank regulators, and of course, to a lesser extent, the SEC, but we'll come back, it's the White House coordinating with the Fed on all this in the first place. But what they've done is push all this now into the shadows. And it basically, they're saying, we only want it in the Tor dark markets. We don't want any of this in the lit regulated markets. And that is going to be a decision that history will not look upon kindly. Yeah, that's well said. I love it. And I would just add that tethers of the world and things like that exist, I think, also because of bank and disdain <laughs> for yes. crypto and fear and over or being overly conservative. So that that's a nice segue. To, now tell us about Custodia and what you wanted to do there to make it to be different. First of all, we have always had a philosophy of ask for permission, not forgiveness, very different than the rest of the crypto industry. Mm -hmm. You see how we kind of got shot for doing that proverbially, but I still think it's the right decision. And I do think cooler heads are going to prevail. There were a lot of theatrics that happened in the last few weeks, by the way, as an aside, that this was meant to send a message to the industry. And I think by the by starting with the Fed and starting with Custodia, the one that was asking permission for everything, the one that was very carefully designing a bank that was fitting within the existing banking rules. And yet we're the one that can't get through. And that was, of course, by design. And we'll come back and talk about this, how the White House and Senator Durbin were attacking us as, at the same time as the Fed Board of Governors and the Kansas City Fed. And these are all nominally independent entities. But, but to your specific question, the banks themselves, a lot of banks wanted to bank this industry. And frankly, a lot of them dabbled in it because they wanted to learn and they're curious. And frankly, a lot of bankers, even in the past few days, have reached out to me 
because they support what I'm doing. They want to draft behind what Custodia is doing with the regulators and trying to break this open in a way that's respectful to the regulators. And um, the problem is that the regulators have tremendous power and they've abused it. And they've abused it in a couple of ways. This, the first example goes back to Operation Choke Point, where the there were 30 different industries that were deemed high risk, right? And so they brought reputation risk to the banks. How is it that that kind of thing ended up in bank regulations in the first place? The answer is there's something called the CAMEL score, and the M stands for management in the CAMEL score, and it's a subjective rating that the bank regulators get to assign to the management team. And so if the management team is doing too much business in industries like adult entertainment or firearms or payday lenders, right? Some of these 30 different politically incorrect industries that were deemed high risk. Then what happens is the management team gets dinged on their camel score and that translates into higher FDIC insurance premiums. They can't get as overdrawn at the Fed. They can't do M&A. They can't enter new business lines. And so that's the implicit and insidious way that the bank regulators had to get back at the banks that were doing business with the crypto industry. And so I've saluted the banks that actually took the risk to do that in the past because they took it, yeah. it came at personal cost and to, to the companies and to the executives for taking on the high risk industry. So what's interesting is the way Custodia was structured was designed to specialize in exactly this industry and to take advantage of the fact that we really do know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And there are a lot of scammers in this industry and we stayed away from them. And unfortunately, some of these deposit hungry community banks weren't capable because they didn't have the knowledge to understand who were the scammers and how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And in a couple of instances now, the CEOs have been replaced. The banks are under extreme regulatory pressure. They've had bank runs that they've had to deal with. And not surprisingly, the bank regulators are reacting to that. What I tried to do, though, was from the inside warn them that there were going to be problems. And we have people working with us who are ex-Fed and, yeah. and they were advising us, why don't you just try to roll up sleeves and be helpful, help the Fed figure out what the issues are. And yes, they didn't heed the advance warnings, but now what do we do? And I sent a lot of unsolicited explanations of what was going on. And it wasn't just to the Fed, by the way. I've had some interactions with other bank regulators as well, trying to help educate and just trying to be helpful because I don't want to see either the digital asset industry or the traditional banking industry hurt by the other. And that's why we're right. trying to do this responsibly. And yeah. it seems, yeah, and it seems like they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater <laughs> yes, here. indeed. Because you, as you've been saying, you've been trying to do the right thing Correct. the whole time. As the complaint says, which is public, you were expecting to get approved to be in the Fed system. I'm forgetting the... The master account. <laughs> yeah, the master account right. should take five to seven days, right? And that's yeah. two and a half years ago now that we're still... And then it got denied. Correct. You must be incredibly frustrated to have to be litigating this. And especially after helping or trying to help that, tell them, like, look, this is what's coming. You should be ready for it. There are bad actors out there. There are people who are greedy and took all the shortcuts they could. You're not acting in that way and you're still getting denied what you say, what Custodia says in the suit is actually something that can't be denied. It's something that is, is actually part of the law. As long as you can meet the requirements, which they told you met, it can't be denied, but there you are. So how's this feeling for you right now? And I know this must be like a two year plus <laughs> odyssey for you after starting Custodia on your own to try to service this really widespread need for banking in crypto has it soured you on it or are you feeling more energized or how are you taking it personally and emotionally it's a good question of course it's been disappointing and it was a broadside we did not anticipate this we were making progress and doing a lot of things in fact there there will be a lot that will come out and light needs to shine on exactly the process and the lack of due process in the process. It will come out. But that was seemingly not the intention from the beginning. It was seemingly not the intention of the Kansas City Fed from the beginning, and I believe that. I, I do believe that the Board of Governors in the spring of 2021 intervened when they saw what Kansas City was doing. And by the way, the Kansas City Fed worked with the state of Wyoming in more than 100 meetings 
in advance of the applications from the chartered special purpose depository institutions to come in the door. So it, just to be very clear, to set the stage, the Kansas City Fed was commenting on the draft legislation and the draft rules and the draft supervisory exam manual. They had a seat at the table the whole time before the first bank got chartered. And then Custodia's yeah. business plan got sent by the Wyoming Division of Banking to the Kansas City Fed in May of 2020, so almost three years ago. They knew it was coming. It was not done in a vacuum. It's not like Wyoming was trying to do anything outside of a friendly process with the Kansas City Fed. And so to, just to continue the timeline, Kraken got chartered in September 2020. Custodia got chartered in October 2020. We both applied for our, ma our master accounts right away. Both had meetings with the Kansas City Fed right away before the end of the year in, in 2020. Custodia was told by a senior member of the Kansas City Fed staff that there were no showstoppers with our application. Then all of a sudden things slowed down. And that's when the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. came in and took over. And that's the, that's where the problems have been. I actually, it, it, it'll be interesting, but I'll be very curious to see when it all does come out just how much the and when the Board of Governors actually did intervene. But one thing is very clear about what happened in the final decision that happened three weeks ago. That is That was directed from the Board of Governors itself in concert with the White House. We do have receipts on that. And it is very interesting to hear the it, when I started asking around in Washington, D.C., what happened? First of all, on, on Friday the 27th, we get blindsided that week. There were leaks in the press that I won't explain why, but had to have come from the Federal Reserve. And they were the leaks were happening the day that our board was trying to decide whether to withdraw our application, which is the choice the Fed gave us withdraw the application or your or your the staff was going to recommend that it would be, be denied. denied. Yeah. And the press was all over us that day saying, we're hearing that you've been denied. We're hearing you've been denied. And again, I won't explain specifics about why we know it came from the Board of Governors, but the White House was absolutely involved as well. We know that as well. There was an aggressive behind the scenes press leak strategy employed against us. And that was all happening when our board was, we were jammed with a very short turnaround period to make a decision. They originally only gave us 48 hours to make the decision. And then we asked for an yeah. extra week and they said, you can have an extra day. In retrospect, now we know what it was all about. It was all the theatrics of the Fed had to go first and custodia was going to be the sacrificial lamb. And by the way, the White House went right alongside Cut right alongside the Fed. And what I'm alluding to is Friday the 27th was the White House announces an anti-crypto statement coming from the National Economic Council. The Fed releases a new policy that never went through public comment that was released at the same time. Then they release at the same time the Custodia membership denial. And then a couple of hours later, the Kansas City Fed releases the master account denial. And then both defendants file to withdraw the law or to dismiss the lawsuit. And then Dick Durbin came over the top on the Senate floor and criticized Custodia. Okay, that all happened in one day. Dick Durbin was two yeah. days later, but it's all coordinated, very clearly coordinated. And again, we, I know a lot more than I'm alluding to here. So there were theatrics to all of this, okay? But stop and think about us as a valid legal business that has been doing nothing but trying to become regulatory compliant and work with the regulators. This is the United States of America. We have statutory protections. We have due process rights. Are, is this country still a rule of law country? I'll give you an example of one of the due process rights. In statute, we have 15 days to appeal a decision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and specifically this was the decision to deny our membership application. We had a 15-day appeal process, and Kansas City jumped the gun to deny us because, of course, this was all orchestrated to be done on the same day and didn't respect the fact that we had a 15-day appeal process, okay? Things like that are being noticed by a lot of people. And again, is it, th th there are so many things, and I'm just relaying the custodia situation. I'm watching it with other crypto companies as well being attacked by other agencies. The agencies are throwing their statutory obligations out the window. 
and taking incredible risks and they are on very thin ice. And one of the things that, that I've heard coming out of Washington is that's all deliberate, that these agencies know that they're overstepping their jurisdiction, that they're doing things for which they don't have statutory authority. But in the political decision that has been made between the Fed and the White House, they want to kill crypto and therefore they are taking, throwing caution to the wind is the way one, put, one, one insider put it. And they expect that this is all gonna get litigated and they even expect that they are gonna lose in court is the way one, one insider put it. But it's worth it because it's, go, it's gonna throw sand in the wheels in the crypto industry. And unfortunately, when you think about the structure of the govern, government of the United States, when you get a divided legislative branch like we have, it's basically impotent and on the sidelines. The executive branch can just basically rise up and grab power, which is exactly what we're seeing the agencies do all over the place. And this is consistent with what this insider told me. They're just doing extra jurisdictional things right now because there isn't anybody to call them out on it, except in the brilliance of our founding fathers, we have three equal branches of government. And the judicial branch is the one that hasn't yet spoken on much of this, but absolutely will. In, in multiple lawsuits, I'm hearing all kinds of things about, okay, who's taking this one against the SEC? Who's taking this one against which, which agency? They're, this whole thing is about to explode in litigation. Well, yeah, I want to definitely get into that and just the, the background of what you're saying here. But first of all, you've been rugged by the Fed, which has got to be maybe one of the first times this has happened. I don't know. But my one, I'd like to start with the curious timing of spring of 2021 when the Federal Reserve got involved in the Kansas City Fed sort of decision-making process. Why do you think it got involved then? Because back in 2021, crypto, we hadn't had the blowups that we had in 2022. Things were starting to move up. It, everything was the beginning of the bull cycle. It didn't, that, that one just stuck out to me. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on the timing there. And then because I can understand them being cautious about it now after we've seen so many centralized failures in the in crypto. But why do you think it was early 2021 that the Fed Reserve started getting cold feet about crypto? This is interesting because it's, I think it's in the context of Facebook Libra. And I think it's also in the context of yeah. what was happening with Project Hamilton, which is the central bank digital currency project that was underway at the time. And, and then I know the internal structure of the Fed has folks from Kansas City on the innovation group. This is public. There's a Fed innovation group that brings in folks from the reserve banks. And so the Board of Governors and the Kansas City Fed clearly had been working together. This wasn't it's not like Kansas City was acting entirely in a vacuum either. But what was the trigger? I don't know. And I sure hope that the light of day has shown on that. But I think you have, it, it, you can't look at it except in the context of what was happening more broadly. If you, if we turn the clock back, the first time a Fed official, first time a Fed Gov, a Fed chair spoke about Bitcoin was, to my recollection, Bernanke in 2014. And he was asked by, I can't remember if it was House or Senate, what is this Bitcoin thing? And Bernanke actually said, it looks like it's interesting technology or some something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that was when I remember Overstock.com, having heard Bernanke say that, said, they're not going to ban Bitcoin. Let's integrate it into Overstock.com. And then they got that done in yeah. two or three weeks because Bitcoin's open source technology. It wasn't that difficult to put a pay with Bitcoin button on the Overstock.com website at the time. And I was one of the people who bought my Christmas presents in Christmas 2014 with Bitcoin. And we were all just trying to bootstrap the network. I, at the time, I hate to think how much of uh, you know those Christmas presents Im implicitly cost. <laughs> it was my investment in helping the network grow. And I think back then, if, they, if Bernanke had said no, we should kill this technology. Bitcoin wasn't decentralized enough, arguably, back then that it if that he could have probably really harmed it. But he didn't. He let it go. And then basically the, the Fed really wasn't saying anything about Bitcoin or crypto throughout most of the its subsequent few years. It wasn't until Facebook Libra came along and then all of a sudden, wham, all the central banks woke up and said, holy yeah. cow, we can't have one of the largest social media companies in the world creating private money. That has to be done through the banking system. 
And so that's about when they started to really take note. You started to see the Fed governors make speeches about it. And to be honest, I'm surprised about how this turned out for Custodia because some of the Fed governors were so supportive of bringing this technology into the regulatory perimeter, is the phrase they use, and of payment system innovation and supporting private sector innovations. If you look at the history of innovations in the U.S., You know, Visa and MasterCard were private innovations. The ACH network, private innovation. So much of the payment history in the United States came from private sector companies. And so I'm I'm really surprised at how this went down, which is why, again, light needs to be shown on this. And it will. I do know, to be clear, the story I've heard lots of folks from Washington tell rush to tell me. And it's actually quite funny because there is an anti-crypto wing of the Biden administration and there's a pro-crypto wing, just like there was in the Trump administration. It doesn't cut across politics like Republican Democrat at all. We have a lot of strange bedfellows and where people cross the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats to support this technology. And even within the administrations, there are warring factions. Even within the agencies, there are warring factions on this as well. And it just so happened that the anti-crypto faction, because of the FTX entree and a couple of other things that I've been hearing from folks in Washington about how it happened and how it all went down, that it it went down where the anti-crypto faction was able to grab power. And how Custodia ended up in the middle of that is crazy and, and potentially, yeah. if this is true, explosive, which is why I think it's going to, I just can't wait for it to come out, to be honest, however it does come out. It will. I'm confident that it will come out because it's a story that needs to be told. And I have no idea how the White House even knew who Custodia was. I have no idea how Senator Durbin even knew who Custodia was. We're not even an operating company. Of course, I was dealing with the Board of Governors and the Kansas City Fed for the last few years, but the President's Working Group never asked, never invited Custodia to the table. I've never met Senator Durbin. I have no idea how they knew I do have an idea now how they knew, but at the time when it was happening, it was bewildering because I it was just very confusing. How is it that Custodia became the tar- the target of all this? And of course, it came from the Fed, and it was all politics. And again, I'll come back and ask the rhetorical question: Is the United States a country of rule of law or not? Yeah. Okay, a lot to unpack there, but <laughs> I feel like I, the thing that I don't understand about the Federal Reserve's response here is that. I don't think anyone is ever claiming that crypto is trying to take over from the United States or trying to replace the dollar, replace the correspondent banking system, whatever, what have you. I think it's always just been, we want an alternative. People want a different way of doing things. And that's what is so powerful about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. So for the Fed to try to basically kill crypto in the United States by cutting off access to banking, it's such an overreaction to where they should be regulating it and letting the innovation thrive because we're not sure where it's going to go. And then on top of that, this idea that the external event like FTX, yeah, that was a bad decision or just a bad outcome for everyone. But Correct. I think, you know, Sam Bankman Fried was also touted around DC as a good guy. He had <laughs> he was giving donations right. to everyone. It's here, look, look at this guy from Stanford who's the king of crypto. And we should all be listening to him. And I think a lot of politicians got into bed with him and now they look bad. So they have to overreact and they have to cover their ass. And I think that's the situation we're in right now. And unfortunately, you're getting wrapped up in that. I just wondered also, one of the more compelling things in the lawsuit that I read that you guys have filed was that banks are already doing exactly what you want to do like BNY Mellon they are they're federally chartered they are part of the federal reserve system they are holding custo- or crypto assets as a custodian they are banking customers who are using crypto and that's they're an incumbent they're already there and you make the, the custodian makes the really salient point in the lawsuit that why are they allowed to do this when we are want to do the same thing and we're getting shut out of the system and i think Hopefully, my faith still will rest with the courts that they will see that and realize that's a very good argument as to why why should you be shut out. But do you feel 
But is this the pendulum swinging all the way one way right now? Are we at that spot where the anti-crypto crowd is really in control? And are you hoping that it starts to swing back to the middle? Or do you think that this has some momentum and legs and we could see more actions from the SEC or Gary Gensler has definitely got a lot on his plate and I think he's doing some good work, but I think he's going about it the wrong way. Is this like the nadir or where do you think we are in terms of that? Yes. From what I've heard, the worst is over. There are still more enforcement actions coming against specific companies, but the big coordinated agency dropping new rules and dropping the hammer on companies like Custodia, that is passed. So you're asking a very good question. Is the pendulum going to start swinging back? And that is a that's it needs to because this is inevitable you've known you've been reporting on this for almost as long as i've been in this industry that this is inevitable right yeah. this is not going away and i think the bitcoin price action since this whole thing started a, a little over 3 weeks ago speaks volumes <laughs> and bitcoin doesn't care about what the regulators are doing in the united states it's just it keeps on appending blocks and frankly Probably flushing even more of the leverage and getting more of the shorts out of Bitcoin caused this nice price bounce. And it's it's flying in the face of the regulators who are trying to hope it just goes away. And so, it, but the, that's the point. It's not going away. And the regulators are just going to have to keep playing whack-a-mole. And I know from your previous work in your Bloomberg days as well, that you recognize that this is the new version of the euro dollar problem, okay? If you take the reality that you can create dollars Let's just, let's, Euro dollars are dollars that are held in banks overseas, basically. Offshore, yeah, offshore exactly. banks, And you can, there's a huge futures contract on it and the interest rate yep. that you earn there is very important to world finance. Correct. Great summary. And the nice thing about it is that the Euro dollar market is as big or probably bigger than the onshore U.S. dollar market in regulated by U.S. financial regulators. Where I'm going is we now have Euro dollar version 2.0, which is the fact that you can create internet native U.S. dollars and 8 billion people can do so with their cell phones. Mm -hmm. And the bank regulators are going to lose control. They are. And they're going to wake up and figure this out. And they're going to bring the high integrity players back to the table. Part of the reason I disclosed last Friday the two things that I disclosed, one was that I was actually warning internally to the bank regulators about the liquidity risk that was building in the banks that were serving the digital asset industry. It was obvious to me there were going to be bank runs at some point. And then the other piece is that I did actually hand evidence over on one of the big crypto frauds. Part of the reason I disclosed that, those were two things I'd never private, I'd privately disclosed, but not publicly disclosed, is just to point, just to paint the picture that essentially the messenger got shot here by official Washington, D.C. But I do know that a number of people in those agencies listened for what I say and respect it and welcomed it. And so the political decision that was made at the very top by the Fed and the White House were trumping the real work that was going on in in the staff levels of these organizations. And again, not just the Fed. It's publicly disclosed that the acting OC comptroller, Michael Sue, made reference to my liquidity discussions in his speech in April of last year. And again, this is not rocket science, right? I don't, these are powerful ideas. This is not about me. This is important stuff. And I care a lot about getting it right. I do not want Bitcoin to be the cause of problems in the traditional financial industry because then Bitcoin will get blamed and vice versa as well. We're trying to solve these problems in a way that takes the risk off the table. And so to answer your question, there are pro-crypto people in the Biden White House, and they just didn't happen to be in the positions of power in the last couple of months when apparently this whole thing got started. And they are now, and that pendulum is swinging back. And I do believe that the high integrity players who did try to help, and they know it, will be brought back to the table. And all these theatrics about skewering, especially the good players, were just that. They were theatrics. All right, now let's come back to the table and roll up sleeves and get something done. I do believe that's going to happen. It has to, because this is inevitable. You have to score political points in DC. That's just how it works. That's no surprise. And sometimes when I listen to people in Congress, whether in the House or the Senate, talk about crypto, 
I thank my lucky stars that they're not doing anything about it because it's, they just have no <laughs> clue and it's to such yeah. a degree. But on the other hand, I've been saying this for a long time, I really think Congress needs to act here and they need to start yes, doing work do. because this is a new industry and it doesn't fit in the old world structure we have, in my opinion. You've got too many new facets here. Like I might be interacting with a smart contract on the theory. Yes. Who, yep. Is that who, what's my counterparty there? It's a bunch of code. So yep. these things don't fit into the Security Exchange Act, the Commodity Exchange Act. You obviously have a really good view here. Why aren't, and I know, let's just caveat this, there is work on stablecoin regulation. And yes. I think that seems to be the consensus of where this should start. But in the bigger picture, why isn't Congress taking this on more and really, because they have the chance to shape this. They have the, like the, somebody, yeah. we're talking about scoring political points and politicians are nothing if not, they're always wanting to grab attention for themselves. So where's that person who comes out and steps out and says, all right, I'm going to take this on and we're going to create the new Digital Economy Act or something. Yeah, we have it. It's Senator Gillibrand. She reached out to Senator Lummis and the Lummis Gillibrand bill, which is omnibus, but they were intending, from what I understand, to break it up into different different groups, a different topic, including stable coins. It's there. I will say one of the things that I think has gotten everybody on Congress on Capitol Hill reticent to do something now is exactly what's happening with the FTX bankruptcy to try to get all the money back that Sam Bankman Free donated to politicians of both political parties, but predominantly to the Democrats. And that's caused a lot of folks. And of course, the Democrats are in charge in the Senate and the Republicans are in charge of the House right now. But that's that that's that has caused a lot of folks to retreat because they just don't want the bad press. Yeah. And so they're happy to let the agencies take the lead. And I think if we go back to that January 27th White House statement from the National Economic Council, from the White House, it essentially said the White House didn't support a stablecoin bill. And the first reaction that I heard from multiple people on the Hill was, oh, the stablecoin legislation just got blown up by the White House because the White House just signified that they're going to veto it. From what I've heard in the just really a lot in the past few days, the gossip around town is that pendulum might be swinging back. Let's see. Again, because politics entered so much of this, which again, to me, these are supposed to be administrative processes that are not supposed to be political. There are due process rights for the applicants in these processes, and they got chucked out the window for political expediency, it would appear. But cooler heads, I think, are going to prevail. And I have continuously left open the ability for that off-ramp. Custodia did not seek a fight here. Custodia was doing everything at every turn to ask for permission, to be helpful, and to try to cooperate and educate. And unfortunately, we've just never had a seat at the table. Again, the president's working group never, in spite of my efforts, never was interested in hearing from Custodia. So I guess maybe that made us a convenient scapegoat. When, the, when it came time to make it all political. But yeah. it's going to change. It has to because of this inevitability. It's a, a, a David and Goliath story here with custody <laughs> against the Federal Reserve. Do you, have you, and I might be asking a dumb question, but I don't think the Fed gets sued very often. Does that happen a lot? Look at, look at the public information. There have been some lawsuits. Yeah. I'm just trying to make the point. They're very powerful and they're usually not held to account. Correct. This is a very interesting case just in that regard on its own. I also found it interesting reading through the suit that it, it seems like one of, the, one of the conclusions it draws or one of the allegations is that the Fed only wants crypto assets to be active in federally regulated banks. And so just for listeners, we have a dual system in the United States, a dual bank charter system where you could be chartered through the state that you're in, or you can be chartered federally. So Custodia was, is chartered through Wyoming. And you are approaching the Federal Reserve for the access that you want to be a member. It was just your right under that dual system. Correct. But I, again, I go back to BNY Mellon and they're federally chartered and they are doing this activity today, right now, that you want to be doing and got denied. So again, just ha why is that hypocrisy not obvious? And am I being daft here? No, you're asking very good questions to which I don't have the answer. Yeah. And I, it's just amazing to me that the Fed is acting like the cat's not out of the bag, too. Like we've said, this is not stoppable. This is a yeah. industry, this crypto, Web3, whatever you want to call it. 
is happening and it's going to happen around the world. Hong Kong, we've been reporting at Decentral, is making pretty big strides in putting out clear guidance for retail investors in crypto for stable coins. Singapore yep. is not far Singapore. behind. Yeah. Yep. And so this is happening. And you the know, BIS. Yeah. We're actually off market in the United States now because the BIS put yeah. out guidance that allows global banks to take yeah. up to, it's now up to 2% of their tier one capital exposure to crypto. People who don't know, that's, that is the bank for banks. Like <laughs> the bank for international settlements is like the kind of the last word on yeah, banking regulation and risk management and capital assessment rules. Exactly. This has been fascinating. Let's just finish off. Like, where does it go next? What are you expecting to happen? We're, we, like I said, we've submitted a revised business plan. This is all publicly disclosed. And we triggered the appeal, the 15-day appeal process the Federal Reserve has until Thursday to decide whether to reopen the membership application vote, presumably on our narrowed business plan. We are still at the table. At, um, this is, we haven't gone away. They, they obviously fired quite a shot at us, but yeah. our board and frankly, our shareholders have been phenomenal. And same with our team, phenomenal. Everyone understood that there was a chance when we went into this, that it would end up this way. But we chose, instead of doing what so many others in the crypto industry did to just ask for permission, ask for forgiveness instead of permission yeah. and just go. And now they're all getting Wells notices. And maybe in the end, that was the better approach because maybe the fines that they pay are just a cost of doing business. But in a regular- and You know, it's interesting. This has worked too. Like I'm thinking of ARC. They went through the SEC mm -hmm. to offer a coin that's backed by treasuries where you earn yes. the yield. Like the, these channels have worked and it, it's odd that this one has just been blocked from you so vehemently. So it's not like you're the first case here like things cool. there there have been quite a few firms that have gone the same route you you're going and have succeeded at it yeah and there's some speculation that what was the issue with custodia's application was that we were proposing to to do a digital dollar and some folks have taken that speculation given how heavy-handed the response from the fed was that the Fed was trying to kill the private version of a CBDC and they're gonna do their own CBDC. I'm not there yet. I have not seen evidence of that yet. I've seen breadcrumbs leading up to potential that the Fed has changed its mind and is interested in a retail CBDC. And certainly the White House is interested in that now. And so the is that a potential explanation for it? We'll see, because if that's indeed the case, the first thing we did was jettison that. And by the way, Custodia was granted the patent last July. This is maybe one of the other reasons why, why Target us first in the stablecoin crackdown, because stablecoins are clearly being cracked down upon. Why Target Custodia first? It hasn't even issued it yet. And the answer is that because we got the patent, first of all, we're a bank. And to have a bank issued version would be very different than a non-bank issued version. But we got the patent last July for a bank to take in a US dollar deposit and issue a token on a blockchain to tokenize that US dollar deposit. And potentially there's been some speculation that getting us, shoving us to the side, getting us out of the way because of that was one of the goals. I don't know if that's true or not. Again, light needs to shine on all of this. Yeah. But what we did do in response was say, okay, you just told us finally, we'd been asking for months for permission to do two things. They came out in their statement on the same day as they denied our membership application and finally gave us the answer. You do not have permission to do those two things. Okay, great, no problem. Roll up sleeves, let's jettison those two things from our business plan. Because again, our proposal all along, and we made this very clear to them, was we will not do anything for which we do not have permission first. And how is it that we didn't have a private conversation about that and weren't <laughs> given the ability to revise that business plan after they had given us the definitive, here's the reason why it's a no, and here's the guidance that was properly enacted to, to justify why it's a no? No, instead, that all came out at the same time, along with guidance that was jammed through and some folks think did not comport with the requirement under the Administrative Procedure Act to get public comment on that guidance. They just instead jammed it through and published it in the Federal Register a few days later. But that was used as an excuse to deny the master or the, the membership application, which was therefore connected to the master account denial a couple of hours later, all connected, okay? So now, if we take that off the table, then 
Does that change things? That's exactly what we just did. We took it off the table. Okay, we're not going to issue the digital dollar of it. It's already off our website, not pursuing it. The second item was a minor one, not doing that either. Fine, no problem. Let's narrow the business plan, take those hot button issues off the table. We've resubmitted it. They have the ability to reopen it and they, ha they, they have the off ramp. Again, we've been the reasonable party all along. The heavy handed activity that has taken place has been on the Fed side. And we've just tried to do everything we can to be reasonable and keep the, keep the ball advancing. And this blindsided us, no doubt. Clearly there were issues with how it was done. And yet we have not gone away and we are still trying to keep the dialogue open to find a pathway that works for all parties here. Yeah, that's great. Caitlin, please yeah, keep fighting the good fight because we need private innovation like this, as we mentioned in the conversation. But always, like, innovation comes from the private sector. That's just what happens. And I'm hoping that the Fed will take a step back and realize that and give you guys a fair shake and let you compete with the incumbents that are already doing this today, right now, like BNY Mellon. I'm sure JP Morgan's got some stuff going on. And I know a lot of other banks, Silvergate and a lot of other folks around the country have been doing this for years. And anyway, thank you again for such an illuminating conversation and good luck going forward. Why don't you just tell people first, is there anything listeners can do to help? And then two, how can they find you out on the interwebs? Thank you. Thanks for asking. Stay tuned. Lots of people have offered to help and we've been absolutely deluged. In fact, <laughs> it's just been such a warm hug. I went through all the LinkedIn comments just today. I haven't had a chance to do it until now. And my gosh, it's it's pretty much unanimous in support and a lot of people asking, what can we do to help? Stay tuned because the trade associations are working on a couple of things and we may ask for the community's help on some of the some of those initiatives that, that do involve Custodia. So stay tuned on that. And then in terms of the interwebs, both Twitter at Caitlin Long underscore and then LinkedIn. And then I'm on Noster now. Noster has become my new favorite little toy. It's a Bitcoin adjacent social media platform, totally decentralized works on a relay network basis and lightning network is just people are sats are flying around on the lightning network like crazy on Noster. And I, it literally in one month, they five X their user base on Noster. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's crazy. It's just an incredible project. And it's got the energy that Bitcoin had in like the, in that, in those early years when I first started coming across your work. Yeah. And it's so exciting to be there and just watch people just in awe of this technology. It's brought back some of those early Bitcoin feelings yeah. that I had when I discovered it, it as well. I think you're putting people in awe too by suing the Fed. I think that's pretty awesome. And so <laughs> thank you for that. And like I said, good luck and keep, please keep us up to date. We'll have to have you come back to give us an update when there's one, something to talk about. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Good to see you again. You too, Caitlin. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks. That's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget to rate and follow this show on Apple, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Decent People is a production of Decentral Media, it is produced by Matt Bogart with music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes.